So I remember uh, when my wife and I bought our first home that it was a little bit of a wrestling match to get them to put community property on the title. Right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, also, the, you know, I mean, I just want to paint a scenario for folks. So I mean, my parents bought their home back in 19... Uh, 57, 58, uh, for about $30,000, and the home is worth probably about a million dollars now. And so um, the, uh, this is a very significant uh, matter uh, for them. And um, anyway, and for our family. <laughs> okay. Right. All right. Well, uh, I have this issue, maybe we can just sort of touch on it briefly, but uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I really think it's going to be sort of a special case issue. But let's talk for just a moment about this temporary repeal sort of of the estate tax for 2010 and how that related to this basis business. Yes, well, uh, it still relates to some extent because, uh, as you know, one of the things people for people who died in 2010, and people yeah. die every day, so it doesn't apply to everybody, but you're actually able to kind of choose which law you want to apply, the 2010 law or the new law that it came, became effective January 1st of 2011. But in 2010, there was uh, no estate tax mm -hmm. for that one year, and so it didn't, matter, it didn't matter how large the estate was if you died in that year under the, under the way it's turned out now, you can choose to apply that law, and if you do, there was no estate tax. But if that's what you choose to do, then there's a limitation on how much the basis can be in increased on the, pros on the property that, that passes at your death. So in larger estates, that's a very significant kind of a decision-making process. I think the, the most uh, publicized death in 2010 was George Steinbrenner, for example. And so that's an estate. I have no idea what their decision was, but they have to choose between 2010 law and 2011 law. Under the 2010 law, they have no estate tax, but they also have a very limited increase in basis mm -hmm. for income tax purposes. Right. And, or if they choose to apply the 2011 law, they have a limited estate tax uh, credit, $5 million, but they can increase the basis on, on uh, their capital mm -hmm. assets. So that, those, are, those are complicated decisions. Uh, again, when they make changes in the estate law, they're usually not simplifications. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're usually complications. And unfortunately, okay, so there's some family members that might benefit and there's other family members that might not, depending right. on what the decision is. Right. And because so, part of what so you now had, what they've done is they set them up for family fights. Part of what you had to do under that 2010 rule was decide which assets yeah. to allocate the adjustment and basis to. And so right. you could make a big impact on different beneficiaries depending on who got or inherited which assets. Right. And not all the documents were uh, had language on how to deal with that. So now we're going to court and we're trying to figure it out. Okay. How about um, legal issues? Well, I think we talked a little bit about this uh, for holding property as community property versus joint tenancy. So we talked a little bit about the basis. Why don't we talk just for a moment about some of the legal considerations? Well, um, <laughs> you're throwing it expand, back at yeah, me. Expand a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we talked about the difference in the. Mm. Well, I think I think uh, one of my issues is is of control. So, when you've got community property, as I understand it, you know both spouses have to agree. For example, if they want to split it up into separate property. Mm -hmm. But as I understand it, that there can be a unilateral decision related to joint tenancy. Okay, I, I'm, now I'm tracking with you. Okay, okay. so yeah, it's how you, um, how you terminate something like a joint tenancy versus community property. Okay, so um, it's possible if you own something with somebody else as a joint tenant to unilaterally sever the joint tenancy. Mm -hmm. it, it has to be done correctly or it doesn't work. But if you do it correctly, then you can sever the joint tenancy, which means that uh, when you die, it does not automatically passed to that person as maybe they thought it was going to. Uh, with community property, it's, uh, not, you're not able to do that as easily because both spouses have some control over the property and have some say over the property. Bas basically, this is one of the reasons why you mentioned the fact that title companies, when you, when you bought your house, you had a difficult time getting them to make it community property. Well, part of the reason for that is that I think title companies have become you know, more flexible on this, but it, for a long time, 
one of their concerns was that if you did a community property instead of joint tenancy, that something like that might happen, and that a spouse would leave their half of the community property to someone else besides their wife or husband, and that the title company might have some kind of liability exposure because of that. Okay, so, so, so there's pluses and minuses. Yeah, I think that's why they were, they were more leaning toward joint tenancy, even though it had potentially income tax um, you know, difficulties compared yeah. to community property. I, I had a situation, this was a long, long time ago, uh, but I worked with a, a CPA who had quite an estate reputation. One of his clients got married, and he made his wife a joint tenant on um, a securities account. And so uh, basically what she did was she severed the joint tenancy, and then she just gave her share of the stock to, the, her, to her kids. Oh. And it was a second marriage situation. So anyway, it's, there's just these weird things. That, you right, know, you, you can be surprised for sure. <laughs> All right. What are some title considerations for entities like trusts and family partnerships? Uh, well, again, you, you know, these, uh, these are entities that can own um, assets. So people title uh, their property into entities like limited liability companies and limited partnerships and into trust. And they, they do a lot of that for uh, planning reasons. Um, these entities also, trust not necessarily, but entities like uh, limited liability companies have a benefit in that you have limited liability. Mm -hmm. So f there are certain kinds of properties that are ideal for that. I think uh, commercial properties, uh, apartment houses and things mm -hmm. like that where you have a fair amount of uh, potential liability exposure because of somebody getting hurt or something happening at the property. Um, so you can, you can title the property into the entity and still have the benefit from an income tax standpoint, as you know, where it's a pass-through type of entity and you still get the uh, personal, pretty much the, the personal uh, benefits of owning the property, but you limit the amount of exposure you have for liability purposes. Yeah. And then for a trust, for example, you mm -hmm. can uh, title things in, the, in a trust, and uh, potentially there's some of that as well if it's an irrevocable trust where you're getting the property out of your estate, uh, but most of the time, uh, for, for most the typical kinds of clients, they're doing it for probate avoidance for purposes. So you get the title of the property into a trust, and then when the owners pass away because they no longer have title to the property in their own name, they don't have to go through a probate to get that to the next uh, generation or group of beneficiaries. So I think, as I understand it, one of the most common problems in this area is the failure to title property to a trust. So you create a trust, and then there are um, yeah. that that happens. Mm -hmm. It happens more often than it really should happen, um, where you set up a trust and then it just doesn't get funded. Yes. Is, the, is the terminology? Yes. And that um, means you didn't really accomplish avoiding the probate and the other things that you wanted to do when you when you uh, set up the trust. But it also happens a lot after the trust is set up, even though perhaps it's set up and properly funded. Mm -hmm. Then people will do things like refinance their property. Yes. And the lenders um, will say, well, we don't want a loan to your trust, so let's take it out of the trust, put it back in your name, close the loan, and then you can put it in your trust again. Well, oftentimes people don't get it back into the trust. And so over the course of time, this gets kind of messy, mm -hmm. and you end up sometimes with assets that are ending up back in probate court uh, because of changes that occurred during the course. The other things people will do is they will buy a property new property, and dealing with the title company and closing the escrow, they won't have it initially purchased in the name of the trust. Sometimes title companies don't want to do that either, although again, they're getting better at it. Uh, but um, if you take it in your name uh, and you have a trust, unless you then transfer it to the trust, you haven't avoided the probate. Okay. All right, this is an unfair question, so I, I'm just gonna ask you to hit um, you know, a highlight or two. Um, and we have a, actually a whole show I've done related to this. But anyway, uh, what about California property tax consideration when you do a change in title? Are there a couple of things to think about there? Uh, yeah, actually, there's a, quite a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of different ways that people change title to property. And, uh, you know, California, we started out in California with something called Proposition 13. That was a long time ago. 
Um, and what it basically it. says is as long as there's not a change of ownership of property, there's no reassessment, except for gradual increases over the years. Um, and then uh, we had other propositions that came along later that covered things like parent-to-child transfers and made them exempt as well. Uh, but when you do any kind of recording of a document that involves a piece of real estate, you have to explain to the assessor's office whether or not it's a, a transaction that qualifies uh, for exclusion from reappraisal. And so sometimes the way you uh, transfer the property, who is the transferee, who's the transferor, the percentages that are transferred, all these things, as you know, uh, have, a, have an impact. And there are also limited amounts of property that you can transfer depending on the kind of property it is and the value that you can transfer without having some uh, reassessment. So um, uh, transferring sometimes to these entities we were talking about before can trigger um, reassessment if you're not careful in how you do it and you don't keep the relationships and the proportions the same. So there's a lot to consider anytime you record something uh, that affects a piece of real estate because it can affect your property taxes if it's not, it, perhaps it's unavoidable, but oftentimes there's something you can do that will minimize or eliminate the, uh, the reassessment potential. Okay, I think we're about out of time. I'm not seeing our time cues. Okay, we do have just a little bit more. So uh, maybe I will um, let you throw out, you know, maybe a final word of wisdom related to title before we wrap this thing up. Well, as I said, um, over my 30 plus years of practice, I've seen uh, thousands, I would say, of documents that, that establish title. It's something that you really should not try to do yourself. A title company is usually pretty good at doing that. I mean, they've got a lot of experience, so they should be good at it. Lawyers are usually pretty good at it, not always, but usually pretty good at doing it. Um, but there's a lot to know about title and a lot to know about the right way to do it. And some of the biggest problems I've seen people end up with in titling situations is just simply because they didn't really understand that what they were doing was either wrong or that it would have a, a complication down the road that they weren't, down the road they weren't anticipating. So for example, I've seen people where parents will sign on to mortgages and get on title to property uh -huh. mm -hmm. and um, with their children in order for the children to buy property, but they end up owning, on, according to the deed, a half of the property or some percentage of the property, which is not really what they intend to do. Right. And now they've got a problem getting off of title. You know, is this gonna be a gift? Is this gonna be a taxable event? I mean, how is this yeah. gonna work? Yeah. So there's a lot that goes into getting title right Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth people's while to get some, some good advice. Okay, well, we hope that we've given our uh, viewers something to think about uh, and motivate you to get, seek legal help in getting some of this stuff, uh, getting your title straight for your properties. And uh, Bill, I want to thank you again for being a guest on my show. My pleasure. Uh, you know, I, I always appreciate your insights and your participation here. So folks, uh, again, hope that we've given you something good to think about, and we hope that you'll join us next time on Financial Insider Weekly.